Hi guys, I want to talk to you in this video about deception uh, and its use in table tennis and what is the best way uh, or the best ways to go about deceiving your opponent and getting an advantage in a point. Uh, although there are a lot of different ways to um, deceive an opponent, uh, only some ways I would recommend more than others, basically. There are some that are a high percentage that work well and often. There are others that are lower percentage and are more of a calculated risk or a gamble. And we'll have a look at all of them uh, in this video and I'll touch on them all uh, for you. I just excuse, uh, I've got my coffee here, uh, just because I've done a little bit of coaching earlier in the day and the voice is a little bit husky, so forgive me when I uh, take a sip here. What types of deception are there? Well, I like to think of there being basically three types, three main types or, or categories of deception uh, that are relevant for our table tennis purposes. Uh, first one, you can deceive your opponent about the speed that you're hitting the ball with, how, how much pace is on the ball. So that's one area that you can deceive your opponent. You can also deceive him about how much spin is on the ball. Okay? Now, within that category of spin, you can deceive him in a couple of ways in terms of you can deceive him about what type of spin. So you could actually make, uh, put backspin on the ball but make your opponent think it's top spin, in which case you've deceived him about the type. Uh, you can also deceive him about the amount of spin. So you could put a lot of backspin on the ball uh, but make it look like a light backspin, in which case You've still deceived your opponent, he knows what type of spin's on the ball, but in this case uh, he doesn't know how much amount is on it. Uh, and of course there's also the ability to use side spin in there to mix things up and make it a little bit harder. But I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. Uh, third uh, area of deception is in terms of table tennis, really the placement. Are you placing it here, here, here? short or deep, um, wide or right down the elbow. So where the actual ball is landing on the table and the angles that you're using, uh, that can be deceptive as well. And uh, unless there's something that I'm missing, and if I am, uh, by all means let me know, those are really, I think, basically your three areas. Your, your pace, the speed of the ball, the spin of the ball, and where you're putting the ball are your three main areas that you've got to work with with deception. So having nailed that down, let's just have a look at them a little bit more in terms of what can be achieved and then we'll talk about uh, how to go about the deception. Why would you want to deceive your opponent about the pace on the ball? What's the advantages of deceiving your opponent uh, in terms of what pace you've put on the ball? Well obviously it's going to catch him out of position, isn't it? So if you can make your opponent think you're hitting a very hard ball, uh, he's going to be heading backwards or expecting to deal with a heavy ball. He's likely to be moving backwards or at least weight shifting backwards. And if you then hit a much softer ball, um, it's entirely possible he may not get to the ball at all or he'll be scrambling because his weight shift will be incorrect. Um, and conversely, if you make it look like you're hitting a very soft ball and drop shotting or playing a touch shot and then at the last minute flick hard or power much more than he thinks, well he may be caught too close to the table and unable to deal. He may not even react in time but he'll basically be unable to deal with the unexpected power and pace speed of the ball. So by changing pace what we can actually do is we can deceive our opponent um, and make him make mistakes both in his positioning around the table, in and out, whether he's at the right place to be in his comfort zone. We can make him reach forward and have to come forward and get it low. We can make him take the ball up high because he's stuck too close to the table. Or we may simply catch him in here when the ball's really getting blown past him very fast and not give him enough time to react. So change of pace is, yes, a very effective way of deceiving your opponent. 
changing the spin. What ways can we deceive our opponents with spin? Well, in table tennis, there's um, a lot of ways to go about deceiving your opponents in spin. And really, uh, effectively speaking, this is probably one of the most common ways to deceive your opponent, is by manipulating uh, the spin on the ball in a sneaky fashion so he doesn't know that you've changed it somehow. So, what options have we got? Well, to start with, say, the obvious uh, example and probably one of the best examples is off the serve. You can deceive your opponent about the spin on the serve, but it doesn't end there. Any shot during the rally can be uh, an opportunity to be deceptive and trick your opponent. Now, without getting into yet how to do that, let's talk about what's the advantages. Well, table tennis, as you know, is sometimes a game just of, of inches and fractions of an inch and very small margins for error especially in the touch game short to the table. A very small mistake from close to the table can have a big effect and can be the difference between clipping the top of the net, going into the net or going over the net. So small errors, small the ability to be slightly deceptive is often enough to get an important mistake out of your opponent. So if we can firstly get him deceived about the type of spin, well, that's one of the most obvious ways to do it, but probably also the hardest to do. Try to deceive your opponent and make him think you've chopped the ball or put backspin on the ball when there is really topspin on the ball is a pretty tough ask because the flight of the ball to an experienced player is going to give away a lot of information and make it fairly obvious that what you've done is uh, not, not done a backspin but done a topspin. It, it can be done. Um, especially in serve sometimes because the ball is bouncing off the table in serve there is the opportunity sometimes to hide what spin is on the ball and do a chop when it's really top spin or do a top spin make it look like top spin when it's really chop uh, even now these days though without the ability to hide the ball when serving it's a lot tougher um, maybe with some of the tomahawk, tomahawk type serves where you can come around the ball and make contact at any point in the spectrum. Um, there's still a little bit of opportunity for that. Um, but it's a tough ask to completely trick your opponent and make him think it's chopped when it's really topspin. But very effective if you can do it. Uh, an easier task, and in many ways almost just as effective, is to deceive him about the amount of spin on the ball. And that's in terms of making him think, well, maybe that you've put heavy backspin on when really you've only put light backspin on. What would be the result? Well, if you've only put light backspin on the ball and your opponent thinks you've done very heavy backspin, the chances are very good that he's going to be adjusting his racket if he's pushing way, way back to get the ball over the net. And if you've only put light backspin, the ball's going to pop up very high. He might put it off the end of the table or just up very nice and high for you to come in and smash the ball. So there's one example where the amount of, the amount of spin is still very, very effective. And uh, vice versa, if he thinks you've, put, uh, thinks you've put a light backspin on the ball when you've really put heavy backspin, he'll have his back quite vertical and the chances are the ball's going to hit and go straight down into the table or into the net. Even if he's only misjudged it by a fraction, that may be the difference between him putting it a couple of centimetres or an inch over the net versus into the net or just up high enough so that when it bounces on your side of the table, the second bounce clears the end and gives you a chance to swing and attack. So it doesn't have to be a big mistake to be effective. But that's, again, a deceptive element. And we usually do that by adding the uh, to make it easier to deceive your opponent, we add the element of side spin in there. And by adding side spin, what you're doing is you're forcing your opponent not only to work out how much back spin or top spin you've put on the ball, but also how much side spin. Firstly, because he then has to deal correctly with the side spin, but also the side spin allows you to a certain extent to mask how much top spin or back spin you've put it on. So if you're swinging like that, Depending on your bat angle, if your bat angle's there, a lot of backspin, backspin and sidespin, 
much more side spin. And if you're changing bat angle through the stroke, it's much more likely that your opponent's going to make a mistake. And if he makes a mistake, he may put the ball on the return of serve, put the ball into the net, pop it up a little bit higher. And of course this can be done during the rally as well. Um, there's nothing stopping you from pushing straight, pushing a little bit sideways, and using some angle and changing through the stroke. Uh, it's a more advanced risky technique, but certainly very effective. So this ability to deceive in terms of changing the spin is usually done by us because we want our opponent to make a small mistake but has a certain result for us. Either being putting the ball just into the net or popping it up enough so that we can get in an attack. It's rare that we try to deceive him completely uh, so that uh, he puts the ball off the end of the, the side of the table or the end of the table. That, that doesn't happen a lot on touch serves, maybe on longer serves, but we're usually talking about, um, as the levels go up, we're talking about more subtle mistakes, smaller mistakes, that allow you to just get him into the top of the net or get his tight return of serve coming off the end of the table just a fraction enough for you to get into that attack. It doesn't have to be a big mistake to be effective. The third type of uh, deceptive behaviour is where you're placing the ball. And um, this is seen quite often in third ball attacks or in strong attacks where you're setting up to attack the ball, the opponent goes one way and you go the other. And basically what's happening is the opponent's not sure about where the placement is. Um, that's a simple directional placement um, deception where you wait perhaps to see where your opponent body weight, he moves his body weight this way and then you go the other. Or simply you leave him waiting there and you hang and then whip it wide while he's still flat footed and he hasn't got any movement in any direction and if you then go wide he hasn't got enough time to get, get his body going to get to the ball. Both of those are good placement deceptions. And apart from the obvious type of placement deceptions where he thinks you're going deep and you drop shot, well, that's, that's a placement deceptive, uh, deception as well. Um, the idea behind placement is really to either uh, get your opponent going the wrong way and then go the other so that he can't recover in time, or nail him to the spot so that he, he doesn't get any momentum in any direction and he's basically having to stand still and then you can go out wide and he can't get moving in time. And those are a couple of good placement deceptions. Um, and again, we're talking about deceiving your opponent here, tricking him, um, making him guess wrong or anticipate incorrectly. Uh, it's not quite the same as going to somebody's playing elbow. Um, that's a difficult stroke just because in the playing elbow he has to decide and he has to move. It's not necessarily deceptive just going straight there. I may know that you're hitting to my playing elbow, I still find it difficult. But if I think that you're going to my backhand but you go to my playing elbow, that's deceptive and difficult. So um, that, that's the difference between a tough shot versus a deceptive shot. And you're trying to fool him, you're trying to make him think one thing and, and do another. Okay, so those are our three basic types of deceptive play. Um, varying the pace, varying the spin, varying placement. How can we go about actually achieving that? How do we get these um, deceptive things happening? What are the best ways to deceive somebody versus more risky ways? to deceive somebody. There are a number of ways, and I've got a little list here that I'm going to go through, um, but there are a number of ways to go about it. In terms of uh, speed and pace, what we're looking at there is, well, if you're trying to deceive both somebody about the speed and pace of the ball, you're usually talking about either swing speed combined with the amount of wrist used to add to the pace of the ball and also sometimes using a deceptive setup. So examples of that, what I mean by that, 
is if you're taking a big, big backswing and your opponent's expecting you to hit with a lot of power or to smash the ball perhaps and smash it. So if you take a big, big backswing and then come in and hold the shot up and, and just drop shot it, what you've done is you've deceived him in terms of the pace, but you've done it by faking him out, deceiving him by, with your setup. And that's one way to do it. Again, the reverse effect is if perhaps you come in and look like you're going to do a little gentle touch shot, and in the end what you actually do is you power flick. So you come in looking like you're just going to touch it over the net, but you actually flick the ball very fast and your opponent's not expecting it, you're doing the reverse, you're giving much more pace than he thinks. Uh, another sort of simple example in terms of uh, this sort of effect is if you're blocking steadily, and steady block, steady block, steady block, and suddenly you force one through, he may not expect that as well. Um, but usually pace deception is either done in the setup, or it's done in the amount of wrist used Perhaps to, in your normal loop, you use that much wrist and then to use a really fast loop, you suddenly snap very, very heavy on your wrist, you're going to be a little bit deceptive in terms of the amount of pace. And it can be, in this terms of deception, it can be a, a sliding scale. It's not all or nothing. It can be you're using a little bit of wrist and you suddenly use a little bit more wrist that's still deceptive. Your opponent may not even, may find that harder to see. Whereas if you used a lot of wrist, what you'd get is a big change of pace. But it may be much more obvious from your wrist action that you've changed it. So you get a, a better change of pace but less deception. And it's a, it's a matter of degree. Sometimes the more subtle changes work better because they're harder for your opponent to spot. So when we're talking about changes of pace, we're generally talking about setup or the amount of wrist that is used to add pace or add spin, and you're manipulating the contact a little bit um, on how much extra pace you're giving through use of the wrist. Uh, you can also use arm speed to swing slower, but that's a little bit more obvious. It, it's, it does change the pace not so deceptive because it's much easier for your opponent to pick up. Obviously when we start talking about spin uh, and varying the spin, your best friend when you're trying to be deceptive in varying spin is use of the wrist in subtle, subtle ways to change the contact of the ball. Now there are a number of ways you can do that um, using your wrist. You can use your wrist to change the angle of contact and if you change your angle of contact you're going to change the amount of spin that you impart on the ball for the same type of stroke. If I'm using uh, say pushing towards you with my bat like this versus there I'm going to be spinning more, spinning more, spinning more. But if I'm doing it quickly you're going to find that harder to read. If I then add wrist snap along the same line as the edge of my bat, I'm making it harder. But if I swing, have my bat at that angle, and I swing at that angle, but I break my wrist sideways and start to vary my angle there, that's starting to get more deceptive. Because as my opponent, what you have to now figure out is not only what, bat, what angle my bat was at the start, or what my angle my bat was at the end, but most importantly, what angle was it at when I actually made contact? And if I'm moving forward like that and also breaking sideways with my wrist, that's much harder to pick up. Okay, so the deceptive possibilities are much better by using the wrist in that fashion. Uh, that fashion, sorry. Now, what's the downside of that? Well, it requires me to be better. I have to be more precise in my swing because the chances are instead of me playing my basic shot if I start to do this there's a better chance that I'm going to mess up my contact and make a mistake myself. So it's riskier for me depending on my technique and how good I am at handling it and that's a matter of practice, being able to practice it more. Um, 
you may never be perfect at it, but you should be able to make subtle variations to make it a little bit harder to read. And it's again, knowing your own limits. Uh, you don't try and do wild changes if you spray the ball around. So you may just make a slight change in the angle, and as you get better, you can make bigger changes. But the wrist, using the wrist to basically either uh, add extra spin or soften the wrist, don't use any wrist to remove spin, using the wrist to break and angle the bat to change more side spin, or simply to push the ball in a slightly different direction um, without adding spin. The wrist can be used as a very deceptive tool um, provided you're a master of the stroke and that's where the practice comes in. It, it's really uh, the favourite example I give. It's like a musician playing a musical piece. Well, this is your basic practice of the piece over and over again. As you get better, you can start to improvise on the piece. And just like a musician playing a jazz melody um, that starts off as a recognisable piece of music and he improvises off it, um, you can improvise yourself and uh, basically take the stroke in other directions by clever use of the wrist itself. Another way uh, to get uh, good uh, deception, and probably for me one of the, my favourite ways to get deception is being making sure that you're balanced when you're about to play the stroke. Just hold on a second. What do I mean by that? How is being balanced important? Well, to give you an example, if I'm playing my forehand and I'm about to play a forehand loop, if I'm balanced and in good position, I can play down the line, I can play to the, towards the person's playing elbow, or I can play wide cross court, or anywhere in between. But those are your main three targets usually, wide, playing elbow, wide, your, your zones that you're aiming for. If I'm well balanced, I can go in any direction. What that means is even if my opponent is reading me closely and well, if I'm well balanced, I can do three directions very easily. That means that if he wants to guess, or if he wants to guess which way I'm going and just take a guess, he's got one chance in three to get it right, if he just guesses me. If he's going to anticipate me, he can't read it from my body weight which way I'm going because I can go all three directions equally comfort comfortably. What that means is, is the only way he's going to know where that ball's going is once he picks up off my bat what direction the ball is starting to travel. And that gives him less time to react. Now, can a good player still react in time and get to the ball? Sure he can. That's why he trains as much as he does, so that he can pick up the ball fast, get to it in time. But what I'm doing is I'm cutting down his time to react, and I'm being more deceptive in that, not that I'm doing anything tricky, but what I am doing is by being nicely balanced and able to go in any direction, I'm leaving all my options open, and he has to either guess early and have a one chance in three of getting it right, or he has to wait and see where I'm actually going to hit the ball and then use his anticipation, trying to pick it up early off my bat to move in the right direction, which is not that easy either. Um, same on the backhand. If you're well balanced on the backhand, your grip is correct, you're not over this way, uh, and you're not doing anything too silly with your arm action, you can go there, 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 with minimal changes in the body, that again allows you, and in some ways on the back end even easier because there's less prep work and the wrist and forearm are more important. So it's even easier just to flip the wrist a little bit to change direction. But being balanced gives you more options and makes your play automatically tougher and more deceptive simply because all, all the options are open and it's harder for your opponent to, to guess or to pick. He then has to wait to see where the ball is going. So it's, it's a benefit, really, of just being well balanced, is that your game automatically is more deceptive. Not because you're trying to be tricky, but you're just leaving everything, uh, all your options open. Uh, another way that you can uh, 
try and be deceptive is use of body language. You, this will, you'll see it from time to time. It's kind of flashy though, I don't really recommend it for the average player. But it's the kind of thing where somebody will pretend to go there and then at the last minute they'll and go down the other side and you know, they'll and even sometimes some of them will look that way and go. When you see that, you're usually seeing um, that's usually a much better player playing a much weaker player, and the much better player is showing off a little bit, um, showing that he can basically do his little look away shots. It's not something you generally see against two well matched players um, because what you're doing is you're working against your natural skills to try and do that kind of shot. And you're trying to trick your opponent by looking there, whereas normally you should be looking at the ball, making contact. So you're trying to take your eye off the ball and trick your opponent with your body language and then using your wrist to go the other way. It's risky. It's a low percentage shot that looks good, uh, but wouldn't be recommended against someone your own level or someone who's better than you even. So deceptive, yes. Do I recommend it? No, I don't think it's a really a, a good thing to add to your sort of arsenal. Another option of being deceptive without actually trying to be um, sneakily tricky is simply to have some patterns that you run with an occasional variation every now and again. Now is this a good way to be tricky? Possibly not. Um, if, you've got a, if you've got a pattern Say, eight times out of ten, if you're hitting this forehand, you hit down the line. Eight times out of ten. Well, the two times that you hit wide cross-court, your opponent's probably going to move to that one over wide. So the two times you do hit cross-court, you, you might quite well hit a clean winner. And it looks good. And people will go, wow, gee, you know, he hit clean, blew that clean past his opponent. What a great shot. But the other eight times, your opponent knows you're going to that backhand side, and it means that eight times out of ten, he's probably handled that very well. So what you're getting there is you're getting some deception in your pattern because you've got a strong pattern going that you occasionally break. And every time you break it, you'll probably throw your opponent off. But in the meantime, all the other times that you don't break the pattern, your opponent's handling it very, very well. So is that a great way to be deceptive? Um, no, it's not. I don't think it's a great way to be deceptive. However, if you're aware during a match that you're playing to a certain pattern and you're thinking to yourself, gee, I've done that shot a lot, then that may be a good time to suddenly change. So it's, it's something I would say it's more something to be aware of. And if you suddenly found yourself playing the same thing several times, if you're aware of it and you can change it, that's a good thing for you. You're likely to throw your opponent off. But if you, during a match, can actually play in a variety of places so that there's no set pattern your opponent can get used to, that's probably better than trying to use a pattern and break the pattern to occasionally throw him off. Uh, in my opinion, anyway. Uh, because the two flashy shots you get aren't really probably outweighed by the eight times your opponent handles the ball easily, um, in my opinion. Another option is to have a wider range of sh shots to, to choose from, basically. Um, and that just means that you're, you're going to be more deceptive. If someone places the ball to your short forehand and you can drop shot, you can push deep and fast to either corner, you can flick it as well to either corner, you're going to be more deceptive than somebody who can only drop the ball back short and play a drop shot. And what you've done is you've made your play more deceptive, not because you're necessarily trickier, but because you have a wider choice of shots at your disposal. It's, it's kind of similar to the ability to be balanced, giving you more variations. Here what you're doing is because you have the skill to play this shot, the fast push, the drop shot, or the flick, you've made your play more deceptive um, because there are more weapons that you can use and that's uh, part of being deceptive as well. In fact, sometimes it's even worthwhile to try and attempt a shot that you don't have just to let your opponent know that you're willing to try it and he may think you've just made an error with it. Um, if he goes back to it and you do it again and you make another mistake, 
you would then better watch out because you may then be alerted to the fact that you don't actually have that shot. So it may be worthwhile to try it once, and if it goes on, great. You know, you, you look really good and you'll be worried about that or be aware of it. But if you go for a shot that you don't have and you miss it, the next time, go back to your other ones. Let your opponent know that you're willing to try it, but try not to let him know that you actually aren't very good at it. Um, so, because otherwise, if he knows you're not very good at it, he knows every time he does it, every time you try it, he's probably going to win the point. Um, and if you don't try it, well, he's getting what he's expecting anyway. Another way to be deceptive, um, which ties in a little bit with my mention of your wrist, another way to be deceptive is the use of the amount of brush contact. In table tennis, um, if you're playing some sort of swing, we say roughly that type of angle, or maybe from the side, if I'm playing that sort of swing, the difference between me using that sort of bat angle versus this bat angle versus this bat angle is a big, big difference in the result on the other side of the table. And those probably from that bat angle to that bat angle to that bat angle is probably a little bit extreme for the amount of swing that you've got. But the idea is being that you know, a small change in your wrist angle through the stroke will change the amount of brush versus pace that you get in a, in a large way. And that can be very deceptive as well because your opponent may be expecting a faster ball Instead, he gets a slightly slower ball, but with a lot more spin on it. And when he plays it, the ball will tend to jump up off his racket a lot. Or, the other way around, he may be expecting a spinny ball with not a lot of pace, but you change the bat angle a little bit and you give him instead of a, a spin there. If you go to here, he's going to get a ball that's a lot faster, less spinny. He may put that in the net because there's not much top spin on it, or he may just not be able to handle the pace and make a clean mistake from that. So bad angle coming from the use of wrist uh, or forearm. You, know, you can use your forearm to tilt. It doesn't have to be from the wrist. You know, it can be from the wrist, but forearm works too. Um, changing the bad angle to change the amount of brush versus speed, yeah, that's deceptive um, by, by all means. Now I'm just going to run through this list just to make sure that I haven't missed anything. So we talked a little bit about the actual overall use of the wrist to change both the brush, amount of brush, or to change bat angles, or to use it to even change placements. You may look like you're going to hit down the line, down here, and by just turning the bat angle, suddenly you're going across court. And vice versa, just a little bat angle. And even through the strokes, when you're going one, two, three, there I'm going down the line, if instead of changing my timing point to get to the middle or to get cross court, if I simply change my wrist, I can, with very little warning, hook the ball wide only just by changing my wrist position, not even changing my timing point. That's much harder for my opponent to deal with because he has less information. The example being really is, say I'm going down the line, typically contact about here or there, if I go to the middle, to the playing elbow, contact further forward. If I go across court, contact quite far forward. Whereas if I'm using my wrist to generate it, I can make contact there, and at the same spot, hook it, hook it a lot. And just use of wrist allows me to place it. Now that's tougher on my end because I have to get the bat angle right without making a mistake. Um, but can be done just through training. Uh, a lot of training allows you then to have that weapon. And again, it's, it's an example of where um, the amount of training you do determines what sort of weapons you have to take on the table. If you have four hours a day, you can train that shot constantly, perfect it, and you've got a great weapon to take onto the table. If you get one hour a week to play, you may find that a very tough shot to master using that wrist, and you're better off just using ordinary timing points, simply because, not because there's anything wrong with the stroke, but you just don't have the specific time available to put in to master it to give you that option. And that's part of the, the benefit of the more training you can do, allows you to master more weapons, gives you more options when you go out on the court. 
So when you have little training time, you really have to make sure that you're spending it on the most effective weapons at, at your disposal. Again, going down the list, we talked a little bit about using body language to be deceptive, um, which in terms of the fake is something I don't really recommend. I much prefer using being balanced to get that effect to allow you to go all three directions. Um, we can also use setups such as preparing for an attack, then drop shotting, or looking like you're going to touch the ball, then changing the wrist and flicking. They're usually more successful and easier to pull off than trying to do the old body fake shots. Uh, using patterns and breaking your pattern occasionally. Again, it's deceptive, but I don't generally recommend it as a tactic from the beginning of the match. I only recommend doing it if you found yourself unconsciously doing a pattern during a match. You realise that you've made a pattern and then you decide to break it then by all means go ahead. But I'd rather not instill patterns just for the sake of the occasional clear winner. It's much better to play moving the ball all around right from the start. Uh, having a wider, wider shots, a range of shots to choose from so that if from here you can play a drive, a loop, a hooking loop, a cross fading loop or a chop if you've got more options, and again, from close, a drop shot, a flick, a fast push, if you have more options in your shots, a wider range of shots, you're going to be naturally more deceptive because your opponent finds that there's more balls of different types coming at him. You have more weapons to throw at him, and he has to be prepared for each one. Um, or he has to take a gamble and try and prepare for one, and if you do the other, you may be unprepared and that's part of the deception. So yep, wider range of shots is always good. Uh, another one uh, that I just mentioned here is um, in terms of uh, when you're out of position, if you're way out of position in a point, um, you may actually, like if I'm stuck way out here and I'm off balance and my opponent has put the ball into my, my tummy, um, I may figure that if I do a normal shot, I'm not going to get back in time anyway because my body weight may be going that way. So what I figure is, well, I'll take a risk and I'll hit down the line and try, try and zip a clean winner past him. Now, is that low percentage? Yeah, it is low percentage. It's not very likely that if, my, if I'm moving this way that I'm going to be able to just go zip and hit one for a winner down the line. Okay? Yeah, it may be a 20% chance. But what we may be thinking sort of subconsciously is that even if I play a safe ball backwards to him and then lose my balance, then try and come back, I may only have a 5% chance of winning the point. So it's better to be risky and try and zip a winner through and sneak one through than it is to play a safe shot that's going to leave you well out of position and yet you're not going to get back into the point. Now the problem is with that is there's no way to exactly know what your percentages are. It's a gut feeling of sometimes, oh yeah, I'm well off balance, I'm out of position, I'll go for the big winner, um, cross court wide, um, or go for the little corner shot down the line, because I know I'm never going to get back. Um, and you're then hoping to make that shot. Is it better to do that, or to play right back to your opponent, get the ball on the table, hope that he misses his next return? Well, that depends on your opponent. If you've got an opponent who's very erratic and misses a lot, it may be better to make him play the ball. If you've got a very good opponent who doesn't miss very much, you may be better off going for the big winner because if you put it back safe, the chances are he will put it back on the table and you're never going to get to it. That's a matter of knowing your opponent. And again, it's part of being deceptive is knowing, well, you know, it's low percentage, I shouldn't really go for it in terms of percentage-wise, but it's still my best option. Um, and uh, that's why sometimes top players will do some shots that you sort of think, well, that was you know, a bit silly or a bit risky, but they figured they'd lost the point, they've got nothing to lose, and they might be able to you know, sneak, it, sneak it through. Um, yep, swing speed. You can change definitely change swing speed to change pace. It's kind of obvious, though. It's much more obvious 
if I'm normally swinging this speed and I suddenly swing this fast, my opponent's going to be able to tell fairly easily that I've changed the pace um, because my arm swing, swing gives it away. Um, so not really that effective. Much more effective in terms of that sort of change of pace um, for us who have combination bats is simply to use the other side, play the same swing speed, but use the, the inverted side or the long pip side the other way around to change pace. That way the only clue your opponent gets is your twiddle and the, maybe the sound of the contact. But the arm, sweet spin, the arm swing speed is still the same. He doesn't get any visual cues apart from the, the twiddle. And sometimes that's not really obvious if your opponent's not looking too hard. Uh, yeah, so you can use your rubbers. So that's pretty much it. Where I'm coming from in deceptive play in these sort of instances is I tend to favour deceptive play that is high percentage, that mixes well with your own game and adds to your game rather than tries to be tricky just for the sake of being tricky. So I favour deceptive play in twiddling my bat to get different spins, to get different paces, to have a wide variety of options so that I can go lots of ways, to be balanced so that I can sometimes attack in any direction, sometimes I chop it, sometimes I play a push or a block or twiddle and hit or hit from here. And what I'm doing then is I'm playing uh, I'm getting deception through that variation rather than trying a lot of the time to play a shot and use a sneaky amount of wrist in terms of breaking my angle. Uh, I personally don't do a lot of that. There are players who do, someone like Craig Campbell, um, who I'll see if I can get a little bit of video up for you um, in the near future. Craig's a, a great example of somebody who can play this amazing touch game and play the ball there, play the ball over there, um, go the other way, swap hands, um, phenomenal touch and feel for placement, spin change, all this sort of stuff that personally I don't possess. Um, and If I tried to copy him I'd look like an idiot because I'd just make a mess of it. So whereas I stick to mainly my fundamentals and simple deceptive techniques, um, Craig's more like a maestro who can really pick you apart just by varying bad angles and, and doing um, stuff that really somebody shouldn't do. It's not really fair, I think. But <laughs> when he's on, when he's playing that way, he can be very, very tough to deal with um, because you simply, he's not playing in a, a way that allows you to read him very well, the balls um, going anywhere at the last minute through great use of the wrist. Um, very deceptive, very tricky, very hard to deal with when it's working. Fortunately, um, he doesn't do it quite as much now as he used to uh, because he doesn't play as much as, quite as much as he used to, thankfully. But when he was playing, uh, it was very difficult, very, very tricky, deceptive, through amazing use of many shot, op and shot options plus a great use of wrist spin variation. Uh, yeah, so that was, um, I consider Craig in, in full flight. Craig was one of the, the most deceptive players probably in Australia. And um, he was using generally normal rubbers on both sides. I'm um, not even using a long pips or an anti-spin. Just using sheer talent um, and ability to be deceptive. Um, I'll take my hat off to him for that. I wish I could do that. But uh, you have to know your own limitations. So, yeah, again, we're looking at, just, just to finish off, uh, if you can focus on the high percentage versions of deception, what they, the also, also the benefit of them is, um, being balanced or having a, a good variety of shots just to, to change is it's not something that necessarily requires hours and hours of work each week plus being in perfect form you can get away with playing once or twice a week um, and still have good effects from this sort of deception because you're not trying to do anything that requires a lot of talent or perfect timing to do it you're just requiring good balance and intelligent use of placement twiddling the bat to get a different effect and the ability to play and maybe use a little bit of wrist um, within reasonable limits. And that can be done um, with only once or twice a week without hurting your basic game. 
Whereas the more riskier versions, um, definitely if you're not in form, if you're not playing a lot, uh, you'll hit one deceptive one and miss ten and you'll, you'll destroy your game and you'll basically play very badly. So stick with the high percentage stuff and you'll find you'll, you'll meld that into your game, um, you'll blend it in very well. If you're playing more, if you're playing six times a week, you can do more deceptive things because you'll have the training behind you to support it. But if you can't train very much, keep it simple. Keep it to moving the ball around when you're balanced, to intelligently using your, um, your combination bat, and to allowing yourself to have different options and not playing to a predictable, predictable pattern too much. And you'll find you'll do pretty much just fine and also, uh, don't forget when you're serving or returning serve, intelligent use of side spin to help make it harder for your opponent to guess how much top spin or how much back spin. Don't try and trick him as to whether you've put top spin or back spin. Just don't let him know how much back spin's on the ball because of the side spin or how much top spin's on the ball. That's enough to be to be tricky. Um, don't try and go for a heavy top spin and disguise it as chop. That's very difficult to do successfully. Keep it simple and you'll have much better chances of success.